episode of Duner's Guide to Merkwood. This is episode 12. I got a special guest from down in Florida, uh, Mark with a C. Mark, welcome to Duner's Guide to Merkwood. Hey there. How, how are you doing today? And thanks so much for having me. This is rad. Yes, it's great, man. I, I listened listen to your discography show. I think I found it two weeks ago. And when you, when you deep dive into you know, Sabbath and The Who and haven't gotten to Janet Jackson yet. I'm curious about that one. Um, but obviously the Zappa, you know, your Zappa um, uh, uh, deep dive was, was really impressive. I haven't listened to it all. I was at the beginning. Um, I jumped to my favorite period, the Flo and Eddie period. Uh, and I just really appreciated the time he spent, um, the honest analysis, right? Because there's, there's a lot of things in Frank's repertoire I don't like. Uh, I talked to Andre from Project Object, and he said, nope, I like everything. And I'm like, you know, there's just there's a lot of stuff I don't. I skip songs on 200 motels, you know? There's some I never skip. But um, anyway, I really liked your interpretation. And, you know, we emailed back and forth. And I was like, I got to get this cat on my show so we can – Talk about Frank, talk about what you're doing down there in Florida, how it matches up with what I'm doing up here in New York, um, and you know, introduce you to my listeners and my, and my viewers, um, and yeah, p- pave the path forward for both of us, but starting off with a, a little talk about, uh, about Frank. I love to chat Frank, so I couldn't be more pleased, and besides, it's a great, it's always a great thing for me when I get a distraction from hey, Mark, where'd your name come from and all that stuff? So I could not be more pleased that you want to kick off talking about Frank Zappa. You have definitely done my nerdy lo-fi heart good. Awesome. Awesome, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, Before we start, this this episode is dedicated to my brother. A lot of folks know he's he's in the hospital right now. He's going to be good. Hoping for an update soon. So love you, John. See you soon. And with that being said, Mark, I recommended a movie to you that you hadn't seen, and, and I think you said you've watched it now, which mm-hmm. talks about the transition from the early mothers, the freaks, you know, the freak out, and uh, absolutely free, and when Frank transformed it into the flow and Eddie period, like the vaudeville period. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a crazy change in the band. Uh, it's, 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 it's a pro- progression in the band, I believe. Um, and I really wanted to talk with you about that now that you've seen that movie and, you know, you, you have your perspective of, of that change from, from, from the mothers from early into that period and, and how you feel about some of the Zappa uh, material from that period as well. It's some of my favorite. Um, so, uh, yeah, what are your first thoughts on, on the Flo and Eddie period of Zappa? Um, I have two uh, completely different lanes of thought on Flo and Eddie and the, that period of the mothers and Zappa. One is what you hear in discography. Now, importantly, I need to make this abundantly clear. When I was doing discography, I was literally taking on the idea of if this really can be a big note, if this really can be a big song, if this is something that you can copyright with grand rights as one continuous composition, then someone should try it that way. So Mm -hmm. most of my reviews were, how does this work in the big song? Now, past that... um, out of all the Flo and Eddie stuff, and that there's mostly four records that I think of, though, I mean, obviously there's others like Playground Psychotics that come right. way later. Post-releases, post-humous releases, sure. yeah. Um, what I could never do is put myself, uh, myself in the shoes of someone who knew just the Mothers of Invention, then just knew Lumpy Gravy and Hot Rats, and then all of a sudden, your favorite cat shows up, Frank, he's coming to your town, but he's brought comedians. Now, this does make <laughs> sense in my head because around the same time, he was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, joking around, or, or maybe not joking, he was pretty serious about potentially hiring Mickey Dolenz, which that would make my heart and head explode. And he, I think he would have gotten much the same kind of humor, much the same kind of delivery had it been Mickey rather than Flo and Eddie. But... Well, he was in, the, he was in the, uh, the Head movie, right? He made the appearance in the Monkey's movie, Head. Oh, yeah. Right. Have you not seen Head? Because it's... Um, oh, no, I have. I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Head's a very different trip than any <laughs> Monkey's anything. And, Correct. Uh, head is in my... <laughs> it's tied with my other two favorite films, which are The Jerk and Shock Treatment. So that's kind of my, my wide palette there. The Jerk's up there cinema. for me. I haven't seen Shock Treatment, so that's, that's something I got to check out. Blues Brothers and Pulp Fiction are mine, just for the record, my two favorite movies. <laughs> not, not too shabby, friend. Uh, but as far as what do, I, what do I think about Flo and Eddie, there are records where I'm really digging it, but I know that on the other records where maybe this isn't making sense to me, I know that this made sense in the building. A great example is the Fillmore East record because after watching the documentary that you had shown me, and I'd seen little clips of like the VPRO performances and mm-hmm. stuff, I knew that Flo and Eddie were so highly visual that I'm only legitimately getting half the show on these live records. 
it so the studio stuff tends to pull me a little bit more and the but to me the pinnacle and the reason i even go back to it and try to find more is billy the mountain it's the most Favorite. perfect 30 minutes as far as i'm concerned that Frank had done up to that point and maybe ever. I don't it's my, know. It's my favorite. It's hands down my favorite. And one of my goals in life, two goals to have every recorded audio version and to get a pro shot video version. Cause that's, that's <laughs> what I want is a pro shot, pro shot video version of Billy the mountain. That would make my life complete in many ways. <laughs> so if anybody out there has one, please bring it to me. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to, to compensate you. <laughs> I, I think if you, uh, I think you may need to start emailing Alex winter. On yeah, I, 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 I've sent a few tweets out to try to get his attention. Once I had Bob Nelson do a commercial with Marky Ramone and Gary Holt from Slayer, I'm like, come on, guys, let's let's let's. I want to have Ringo Starr on here to talk about 200 Motels. That's the, the ultimate goal. That's oh my goal. gosh! <laughs> uh, you know who else uh, <laughs> probably has a really cool story or two about 200 Motels is uh, Keith Moon's driver, because Keith Moon was not. Um, he was. Well, would you trust him behind the wheel? But past no. all of that, he could not. He just couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. So um, he had just gotten a new sort of butler. I think this was Dougal Butler. I may be getting the names mixed up. There was one previous that had passed away. So just like Ringo Starr's chauffeur plays an intensely huge role yeah, in pretty funny. motels, Top there's actually well. a whole different chauffeur who may, and, and as far as I know, he's still alive. Wow. He may be the guy who can actually tell you the real stuff. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I've been thinking, and I listened to, we listened to your um, 200 Motels interpretation, and I started going back in my mind and thinking of how much that movie meant to me. And when I started watching it, and just the sheer fact that, so this is uh, five, six years after his first release, he has one of the biggest musicians in the world, Ringo Starr, playing him. And he has the, one of the biggest pop groups in his group, and he has the drummer from one of the most powerful groups in the world playing a drunk nun on Quaaludes. Talk about the master of puppets. But like he'd already that. done that. He'd already done it. He, uh, he'd already been portrayed as someone else while he was sitting there on the monkeys. Mike right. Nesmith was yep. Frank. And yep. Frank was Mike. So yep. You, yep. you can just watch the seeds all through those years if you look at Frank's visual career. Like, God, how could, mo how could 200 motels not have happened? Right. But just a sheer unmitigated audacity of what he did back then. You know, he's right. like, no, nah, I'm going to have Ringo Starr play me. I'm gonna, you know, it's, 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 it's so ballsy and so awesome. It's, it's so, just the sheer magnitude of what he did. And, the, and also the first film recorded on videotape, I believe, right? The true story of Motel, uh, 200 Motel says that. He was really, you know, he did it all in such a short period of time with under $700,000. And uh, I think it's magnificent. Um, I, I love it. I, I, I want to get it on DVD. I don't have it on DVD. <laughs> Hoping they re-release it. You talked about that on your show as well. There's one in print, and that's the one that I was watching last night uh, to prep uh, for today. But if you, uh, for example, order that copy on Amazon, you're literally just getting a CDR or a DVDR sent to you. Um, right, it has right. okay packaging. You don't know until you flipped it over and looked at it, but mm -hmm. it is legitimately a CDR. I don't think there's an actual version in print but I keep hoping that this is because there will one eventually be a version with subtitles because a lot of stuff is uh, kind of a, a lot of the dialogue is on the same frequency spectrum as say a symbol going on in the background or this sound effect. Mm -hmm. So a, literally a lot of the words are lost in the film. And yeah. I think that that would, I think just being able to watch 200 motels with subtitles would legitimately give the whole thing a complete reappraisal. I think that, currently is the biggest problem with it interesting actually well we shall see what happens i did notice it's not listed on spotify right so so it has all frank's works except for the 200 motel soundtrack right so that's because they could yeah. they cannot and still uh i don't know if anybody's trying i've read some stuff but it's so 15th hand who knows what to believe right. that gail was not that concerned with getting the soundtrack to 200 motels uh, back once Ryko got the rights for a little bit. My understanding is that Gale basically maybe let a bunch of really important dates fly. That's what I understand. Okay. I could be wrong. Hmm. My God, I hope I am. And I hope it's just United Artists knowing that they're sitting on a gold mine and yeah. wanting to be compensated for said gold mine. Now, the soundtrack to 200 Motels is a completely different trip for me. 
that feels more cinematic to me than the film. Hmm. Because I have all this time to let my mind wander and then I get to be surprised when something like she painted up her face shows up again three minutes later yeah. after I've just kind of had my mind scrubbed by some orchestral stuff. It's really, when you drop the needle on 200 motels and you don't know it's a film, it is a war between the complex instrumentalist of, the, of, of Frank Zappa and the Zappa who's got to pay the bills. Mm, yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, the main thing that drew me into two hundred motels was Magic Fingers and um, and Mystery Roach. Music. Oh, those yeah. are the two were just like such solid, like ACDC kind of like energy with you know Ainsley Dunbar just totally changing the sound of the band and the power of the band. Right? He just oh had, god yeah, had so much power to it. And then everything else just you know came after time of repeated repeated watches and listens. Um, so let's move on to my favorite, right? Which is which is just another band from LA. Uh, Billy mm-hmm. the Mountain is is just. I just love it. It's my favorite Zappa song, my favorite song, probably period. Um, Ed Palermo told a great, told a great story on my show about, you know, going from New York, New Jersey to New York, when he wasn't supposed to cross state lines because of a legal issue and going to see Billy, Billy the Mountain in, uh, in the, at the Fillmore East, they closed with it. And, um, you know, that's just something that I just loved that song. And you saw in the documentary that they would rewrite it for each city, right, that they'd go in, which is just, it's maddening to think that they had, how they did that. And, but it must've been so much fun to do. Um, so what are your thoughts on Billy? I know you've we talked a little bit about it and, and what are you thinking, Mark? Well, I'm really surprised that 200 Motels became the movie and Billy, Ma- Billy the Mountain did not. Yeah. I, I will never <laughs> understand that yeah. as long as I live. Um, there's nothing I don't love about Billy the Mountain other than it's hard to get more than 25 or so minutes of rock music on one side of an LP because otherwise we may have gotten a longer Billy the Mountain. It's that True. recording at Fillmore East was much longer. Well, there's and, a 50 minute version, a 54 minute version. <clears throat> and that's too. why they, that has to be why they close with it. Uh, I mean, yeah. hell, you probably open with it and you're like, and then we'll play some other stuff if the union doesn't kick <laughs> us out. Like, but ever, there's nothing I could love or, or nothing I could not love about Billy the Mountain. I love the recurring themes. Uh, I, I love the, uh, we're just signifying New York with the Tonight Show music. And um, I, I believe it's, no, I'm sorry, on that one. Yeah, New York. I don't know why I'm second guessing myself. Carnegie Hall, is that Carnegie Hall? Yeah. Uh, no, that's Fillmore East that I'm thinking oh, about. Uh, Playground Psychotics one, then, right? Uh, probably. I'm probably yeah, conflating yeah, yeah. a few versions. I mean, I do love Billy, but after you've heard enough recordings of Billy, you start mixing them up a little bit. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what I really don't understand is why they didn't just completely drop side two. I've got no problem with side two. I love side two. We'll talk in a minute. Yes, there's a caveat there. But why in the living was billy the mountain not just the record because then you get the chance to just have studebaker hawk as its own portion of the suite you can pull just i gave him the money like just the catchy parts Mm -hmm. and you've got something to market here billy the mountain is now a world you can walk into i feel like it almost doesn't get its due because there's all right if that's too lofty of a concept for you don't worry there's some shorter songs on the second side. I think that's the biggest handicap for Billy the Mountain. But I can't really give you a review of Billy the Mountain other than it's perfect. It's perfect on every level. But how on earth did Howard and Mark remember the new lyrics every day? And and, and it's not like it was a quick, like quickly, quick lyrics that had to, it's not like, you know, loosey goosey stuff. (laughs) This this was aggressive. Uh, You're right. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And and, and they were, they were the pot smokers on the tour, right? Supposedly, you know, Frank was against all of that. And you heard in the documentary, they said once Flo and Eddie came, (laughs) they they brought the grass with them. Yeah. Um, Jeff was thrilled, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's pretty funny. Pretty funny. (laughs) So um, Quality Vegetables is another one of my favorites. Um, and, and I think really one of the reasons it's my favorite period, Flo and Eddie period is my favorite period, because Zappa's guitar tone and the solo in Quality Vegetable is, is, is to me one of his most perfect solos. It's not his most complex, but there's just a few moments in there where he just takes me to a plane of where I want, where I need to be and where I would want my sound to be. And, and it's funny, so it's a funny song. I like it much better than the early Mother's version, which was a little slower. Um, so what do you think about Quality Vegetable? 
The Flo I and dig, Ellie, just another band version. Oh, I, I, it's the one that I, I'm more liable to reach for mm. uh, than the absolutely free version. Yeah. But if I need, if, if I want the absolutely free era version, I tend to use the, uh, for personal listening, the edit from Mother Mania. Mm. I, I like it a little bit more when it's condensed. And I feel like the only way that I like it stretched out a little bit more is just another band and it's it's down to exactly what you're talking about it's the guitar tone that super mid-range chunk yeah that's behind it oh. it sells it and then colony vegetable is already catchy but mm-hmm. when you hear the basically three-part harmony just coming at you with the first line you're like whoa whoa this is a different composition now yeah this is. is not what i signed up for <laughs> where are you taking me frank yeah. so i got no despite what I said earlier, I got no real problem with side two. Just imagine how much better it would be for Billy the Mountain. <laughs> That's right, what I agree. Uh, poor Billy, poor Billy. Yeah. <laughs> Used to one side of an album. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to have to mention this. So the, I, I did, I was lucky enough to once see Flo and Eddie. Dweezil Zappa did a show up in Woodstock with them. It was the end of the Dweezil week and Flo and Eddie played and it was really life fulfilling. And I just want to share this artifact. This was a, a, a Cal Shanko, which I'd ordered a month before. So Cal signed it. Got Dweezil to sign it. I got Mark and Howard to sign it. Um, my favorite album. Unfortunately, they didn't play Believe the Mountain. I didn't expect them to. They didn't play Call Any Vegetable, but they did play one of my other favorite songs on the album, uh, which is Dog Breath, right? And it was so good. It's on my YouTube. I have a link to it on my YouTube channel. Um, Dog Breath, I think, is a great tune. Uh, I think it's one of the, probably the catchiest tune, uh, um, in, in my opinion. Uh, what do you think of Dog Breath? I love Dog Breath. Uh, especially the Just Another Band version. Actually, mm-hmm. that was the first way that I found out that I liked the track Dog Breath because it was starting to just fade into a bunch of melodic yet intensely percussive stuff in, um, in Uncle Meat, where for a while I, was, I just couldn't find a way in with Uncle Meat. It, was, it just seemed one, impenetrable. Yeah. But when you take Dog Breath out of context and instead give it the very rock arrangement that you've got on just another band. I'm like, wait, I get this. Now let me hear the original and it'll make sense to me. It's almost like I needed it. And I I don't mean this in the true sense of the term. It's like, I personally needed the song to be dumbed down. Mm, And mm. then it worked for me completely. And now every version of dog breath works for me. Yeah. Um, should we just jump into it? Because I've been holding back what I really think about the Flo and Eddie period. Yeah, let's hear it. Let's have it. All right. Um, Magdalena. Magdalena <laughs> is the track where I have a very difficult time enjoying uh, the track. Here is why. First of all, I am completely aware that Frank often took subjects and conversations that he overheard and turns them into songs. Especially the harder to believe and harder to swallow that they am, the more or that they are, the more likely Frank is gonna be excited by that. So I know we don't get a Frank Zappa unless he does those things. And I want to believe that Magdalena comes from that kind of place. But when you marry lyrics that are absolutely about incest to a very victorious melody, it's gonna creep me the hell out. And it still continues to creep me out. It's never not going to creep me out. And here's why. It didn't have to be that way. Imagine Magdalena. Just the first verse. The do-do-do-do-do-do. Now, take all those words away and do the ABCs. The song is not worse. It's better. It doesn't have the shock value. Frank was trying to shock people with that story. He was trying to make it make it a, a, a bad story and then you know make fun of of of, of not of the person or not of the people. I don't think he was trying to hurt anybody with it, but I think it was in the spirit of Frank. And I, I don't think, I mean, I I listened, started listening to it at an earlier age, right when I was a kid. I was listening to this when I was probably thirteen or fourteen, um, and, and I've never had a problem with it. And, and I, I hear what you're saying, right? If I listened to that for the first time today, I'd probably be offended. If I'd not known Frank and someone said, "Hey, listen to this," I'd be like, "What the heck is that?" But I have context. I have context, and I don't think they were reaching. They were reaching to be beyond the edge of of, of, of offensive, of, of of funny, of of. And sometimes when you're dealing on the edge, you you go in directions that are going to send people the wrong way. Which which I understand, and I respect your opinion on that. It makes sense. But before um, but, you even get to the words, this is the fatal flaw in him attempting to shock. The fatal flaw is that Magdalena is already shocking because mm-hmm. it is the most 
catchy and straight ahead thing yeah, yeah frank sure had so. released in years so you right. literally sing the abcs to it and everybody goes wait a second a frank zappa song i can tap my foot to it's almost like he had to self-sabotage. I was just thinking he had that same exact thought. He was like, you know what? I don't want that. I'm going to go in this direction. And just to bring it, if you listen on Joe's Garage, when he's talking to Mary at Cahoga Park, he talks about right. her dad in the tool shed waiting. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. that's just, it's one of his little tools, one of his funny things that, you know, again, I don't think it was done in a sinister, mean way. Um, but I understand your context in the same way. And where this comes back to Flo and Eddie is this one, uh, I think it's it, Howard's got the, the co-writing credit. Correct. So with them having their own homework, and I don't think he gets a credit in Billy the Mountain, though he had to come up with those names, dates, and places. Mm -hmm. Frank very much wanted you to know that those words came out of Howard. <laughs> and this is why I've always seen Flo and Eddie at their, at their most offensive mm -hmm. as Frank's bullet shield. Like Frank going... No, they said it. They came, they're the guys with the microphones, not me. I play these cool guitar so No, watch me. I conduct. I'm the serious musician. But then if there's a standing ovation, he can go, I'm Frank. I will accept that. I feel like Flo and Eddie got the worst ends of both sticks. That's my takeaway from the Flo and Eddie era. But my God, what an amazing thing to do to literally conduct human beings as instruments. It's, it's, and it's, yeah, keep going. Uh, so did you, you see the John Lennon Yoko Ono performance? With oh, Flo yeah. and Eddie? Um, well, I saw the uh, the clips in, in uh, the, the documentary. I knew. Well, those... no, there's a 20 minute oh. video of the performance, and John Lennon comes on stage, and Yoko Ono comes on stage, and Flo and Eddie put a burlap sap over her, and they do a scumbag jam. So they literally have Yoko Ono, John Lennon's wife, on stage with her in a scumbag, seeing scumbag pointing at her. It's like, so Ringo Starr plays him in a movie. He has John Lennon on stage playing guitar, puts a bag on his wife and has Flo and Eddie call her a scumbag over and over to a beat. To, to, to your point, you know, it's just the, the conducting human beings. It, it, it was, it's phenomenal. You, you should go watch that. I think it's like a 20 minute clip. Uh, it's really good. It's not good. Yeah, quality. I'd be interested in seeing that. It's I, not I good quality, but it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's the, the whole scumbag jab is so funny. <laughs> yeah, I'd check it out. Um, yeah. And I think that that's a lot of where I lost Flo and Eddie for so many years that I only have these records. Mm -hmm. I grew up with the records. I don't, what I don't have is the knowledge and feeling of what it was like to know Zappa and then to know that was the new Zappa. Mm -hmm. That yeah. I don't know. I kind of learn it as a big gumbo. So, yeah. Yeah, there's no, I, I guess I should make it clear. This is, oh my God, you could not pay me to knock their talent. Those guys are singers extraordinaire. Their Im, uh, improvisational skills are heretofore almost undiscovered in human beings. And the ability to be given a task, complete it, make it funny, and make it make sense to every last human being in the room with maybe two hours of notice. And that's, that's on a good day. You will never hear me say a bad thing about them as people or performers. How do I think it matched with Frank for, well, I think it ultimately ended up being the least timeless music Frank ever made. That doesn't mean it's not good. Uh, and obviously I love me pretty much everything but Magdalena. <laughs> um, and I, and even then, I only don't like the words of Magdalena. That's the only part of that. There, that's the era where I'm least likely to reach for it. But some of the stuff that I would reach for now for pleasure might surprise a, a Zappa fanatic. Like I, I am just stupidly into Broadway the hard way, especially in our current climate. You know, like man, it, when the lies so big. Like, did he knock that one out of the park way too early or what? But I won't get ahead of myself. This is your show and you wanted to talk about Flo and Eddie.
Congrats. Sure, I'll I'll try to uh, cram uh, twenty years into a couple of sentences. I uh, I mean, oh, I I just always sound sarcastic. Please excuse that. Uh, so uh, I'm an interactive singer, songwriter, and storyteller. Uh, depending on which day it is, I'm a little more of a singer, a little more of a songwriter, a little more of a storyteller. I'm a lo-fi creator. Um, I do the best that I can with the tools at my disposal. If something isn't perfect, hell, I'm excited because then it's closer to real. Uh, if you want to just kind of jump into some things that I've currently got going on that are not discography, but I will tell you about discography in a moment. Um, just released a three LP box set, the best of Mark with a C. Uh, maybe it'll be good. These were all voted on by fans. I didn't choose these songs. Um, I, I don't think I would have chosen some of them. Um, but it's, importantly, it's never up to me what the best is. It's up to the people that receive it. I create for myself. I release what I think there's a chance someone else will dig. I also uh, have a new film out called The Obscurity Show. And uh, if you want to know what it's like to be a guy named Mark Sidorius who portrays a persona named Mark with a C, there's a book about that very thing. And uh, past that, Discography is a podcast where I take a deep dive into understanding the catalogs of musicians uh, as best as I can, trying to leave the gossip at the door and only use the tones heard, trying to leave a lot of factual stuff at the door and go, what story am I told here on the record? However, that's changed with each season. Each artist demands different treatments. Uh, so our Janet Jackson season does not review all of her music as a big song. And our Who season, I just set out to basically make the documentary they always deserved but never got. The Black Sabbath season, I asked the question, no, really, what is Black Sabbath? Because you ask 20 people, you get a bunch of different answers. And season five is my argument for who may be the greatest American rock band of all time. And I will not give you further hints than that. Most of what I do musically, you can find at markwithac.com. Up top, there's a ton of icons, and they'll take you to most of the stuff that I do. If you want to listen to discography, discography, you just type that into Spotify, bam, you find it. You type it into Google Podcasts. It is the first podcast result that comes up. We got lucky. I don't know how this worked out. And uh, same with if you uh, look us up on Facebook and you just want to connect with us. I, I don't hang out on the social media all that much because I couldn't get anything done, and I'm a prolific some bitch. So uh, really, this interview has been my break today. So thanks for the break, Michael. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, we'll do this again sometime soon. Bye, all.